Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, Dr. Anthony Fauci on the strides against COVID made in Indian country and what it can teach the rest of us. It is the custom and the tradition that one listens to the tribal leaders. Plus, Senator Martin Heinrich joins us from Washington to talk about a throwback jobs plan. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. We're keeping you in touch with newsmakers in two great interviews Plus, the line is going all legislative as we enter the final few weeks of the session. We'll dissect the civil rights bills that affect policing and criminal justice. And our line opinion panel also looks at the fight to rein in high interest rates on short-term storefront loans. We begin with the effort to legalize recreational cannabis. Here's the line. The road to legal recreational cannabis has been full of speed bumps, dead ends, and detours. It's required some advanced navigation on the part of advocates and even from those who oppose it. Are we near the end of the road? Our line opinion panel takes that question up as their first foray into the headlines this week. Joining us, our editor and publisher of the Santa Fe Reporter, Julianne Grimm. Attorney and public safety expert Ed Perea returns. And from the Garrity Group PR line, regular Tom Garrity is back. Now, Julianne, as it stands, there are at least three bills in the Senate committee that plans to have a hearing on Saturday the 6th. That's tomorrow to see if they can reach a consensus, but the odds on favorite to pass the Senate is actually a House bill, that's HB 12. Does it feel like there's a solution coming to you? You know, I think there could be. Um, certainly the Senate Majority Leader and the um, Chairman of the committee that these bills are currently parked in gave some really clear direction last Saturday um, mm -hmm. to kind of what he would like to see, what the two of those men would like to see um, come back, you know, uh, this weekend when the Senate committee takes this up again. Um, and that's really, you know, the spirit of compromise. Uh, nobody really wants to vote on three or four bills. Mm -hmm. um, but as is the case usually in our legislature there's a, a you know good degree of cooperation where the senate bill that's been proposed by senator candelaria and the house bill that's been proposed by representative martinez among others um, that they already have a lot of similarities and they were you know described as companion bills um, they don't line up exactly but you know for the purpose of 183 pages at last count um, i think that they are you know functionally similar um, and that's kind of, it seems like the, the, the uh, bill that has the most support. Um, however, you saw a lot of provisions in a bill coming out of a Republican from the South, Senator Cliff Pirtle. Um, and some of the rural senators uh, favor provisions in Pirtle's bill. And Senator Candelaria said that he was amenable to um, kind of rolling some of that in. There are big differences that they're not gonna be able to resolve. But, um, you know, I think that we're going to see some compromise version show up on Saturday morning, but not much before then. That's a good point there. Uh, Tom, interestingly, this is not a terribly partisan issue as it's unfolding. It's really kind of interesting to watch. Um, but, but it is interesting. Julianne just mentioned there are things starting to come into the tent, as they say. And one of them is the idea from Republicans to let municipalities opt out of legalization. That's not part of the House bill, certainly, HB 12. But talk to that. Is that potentially a big problem here? Well, you know, it, uh, local control, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, originally, it, so that's, that's a huge issue. And, you know, who's, you know who is going to be the one you know, with the hot potato of responsibility? And who's going to get the, the bag of cash uh, through all the revenues? Is it going to be the state or is it going to be the, uh, the local uh, right. government? So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what's really, I think it's going to be one of the driving forces because, Originally, one of the original items that came up with uh, with this whole discussion was, um, you know, we have to find a way to make up for the shortfall in oil and gas revenues. Right. So it, at, at first it was a revenue discussion and then it became a personal freedoms conversation. Uh, and then it became, you know, uh, let's let's tie the, the medical back into this and stuff. So it's, it's really taken many different forms. So, you know, I'm going to be very interested to see what House Bill 12, because I think that's really the bill that is going to be, uh, you know, shaped and formed. It's the foundation is there. Um, the contents of the legislation have been remodeled over and over, as Julianne had been talking about. So I'll be very interested to see what the latest remodel looks like 
on that House Bill 12 foundation. Right. You know, I hate to you know, put this as some kind of Super Saturday, you know, Super Bowl kind of thing here. But when you think about it, guys, this is the last Saturday to be able to do these kind of things. If you think about it, next Saturday potentially is much too late and certainly not the Saturday after. Uh, so this is it. And, and interestingly, the social justice aspect, big potential sticking point, And one of them is uh, the terms of requiring expungement to legalization, meaning if you've got a, uh, something on your record for a mar marijuana a violation in years past, it will be removed. That's a standalone discussion, it seems to me, that needs some serious talk. Does this have a potential to, to torpedo this whole thing? Well, it, it may. I mean, this, this has always been, again, you have two different camps there. I mean, one camp says, hey, if this is now legalized, why should someone who's been charged with it in the past be, be harmed by it with possible employment or, or, or other forms of di discrimination as a result of this past record? Uh, the other side says, well, it's so important that this, if this is part of an individual's history, that people are aware of it, that employers or anyone else is aware of it. And I think it's, it can be so contentious and, and we have two sides of that issue that it could be uh, a sticking point that could torpedo, torpedo the, the entire legislation. But it sounds to me like there are some efforts to compromise. But again, I, as you say, Gene, there, there are some concerns about that one sticking point. Mm -hmm. A couple of organizations out there, they're on the record having uh, some problems with that. Uh, Julianne, interestingly, I, I, I want to talk about timing. Uh, it, it's not fair to look back and say, oh, if we had done this maybe three, four years ago, we'd be cashing in. But I'm seeing the estimates for what we can expect to come in from legalization on the recreational side as far lower than what people were hoping for even three to four years ago. I'm hearing 90 million, 100 million, not chump change. But as Tom mentioned earlier, we need some way to make up for oil and gas. What are you hearing for potential uh, income, so to speak, from, from recreational? What, what's your research telling you? I don't think that um, there are many people who believe the cannabis industry will replace the oil and gas industry in terms of revenue. Um, I don't think we're that's even within the realm of, of anybody's hope, but it's one of the, I think the backers will say, one of the ways that New Mexico could diversify um, its tax revenue stream. Um, but you know, that said, all of the various government groups and the contracted folks that are um, looking at this question of tax estimates it's all over the map. Um, you've got Dr. Kelly O'Donnell, who is the analyst for the Senate committee that the bill is currently parked at. Um, she's been working on this issue for a number of years, and she's developed a demand model um, that takes into account how the illicit market and the regulated market will interact with each other. So one of the things that she's noted is that um, it's not going to happen immediately that all of the black market cannabis dries up and all of it becomes taxed, um, that there's going to be a, a gradual shift there. And so, um, you know, you've got these estimates that range from, you know, as low as 25 million in the first year um, to as high as 150 million in five years. You know, the, the question also remains what the tax structure will look like. The various proposals range from everything from a 9% state excise tax, which is stacked on top of all the local gross receipts, um, you know, down to a more flat rate uh, that just comes back, you know, to the locals. So there's a whole range of tax proposals. And again, we're not really going to know which proposal has traction, um, you know, until this sort of backdoor negotiations um, finish up and we see what happens on Saturday morning. Ed, interestingly, I'm curious, you know, Julianne makes a very good point, you know, and, and when you think about it, it seven, you know, 70 million, you know, 25 million, whatever the million is, that's all well and good. But the, the, the tax bit is tricky. A lot of folks are feeling like if you tax it too high, you're just going to drive people back to the black market anyway, if the cost of it is too high. As a law enforcement person, does that make sense in, you, in your gut? Well, Gene, I, I, I know we focus a lot about the, on the revenues. We talk a lot about the, the revenues and what it can do, do for the state and re, replacing other forms of, of revenue. But what we're not talking a lot about, again, are the, are the costs associated with the legalization of recreational uh, marijuana. And, and I think that's something that needs to be taken uh, a little closer look at. If you look at some of the some of the other states uh, that have already legalized, their their social costs are are incredibly are incredibly high. Mm -hmm. 
And so we want to we want to take this slowly and not only look in one direction, and that's the revenue that we would make, but actually the the, the social costs that uh, that may come out of this. Ed, I have an interest to ask you directly: Are are you generally in favor of this, or do you feel like there's just too much stuff out there uh, to to be uh, making this legal at this point? I. I I'm a political moderate, and I, and I like to look at both sides of the, the issues. And obviously, the, the extremes on both sides have a very strong position on this. Uh, this has been a movement that's been coming on for some time. Uh, I, of course, as you know, former law enforcement professional, you know, I've seen the, the effects, the negative effects of drug use of right. all sorts. And so, you know, when we start talking about legalizing yet another substance, which can have negative social cost in a variety of different ways, whether it's with our health care or even the, the crime that may result as, as a result of, of use. Uh, I, I think we want to be very careful as we walk down this road. I am more for uh, let's let's walk cautiously and, and, and let's not uh, be in too big of a hurry to, to get this legalized. We know this has been a movement for some time and sure. some might argue, that, hey, we've been working on this and, and the time is now. But I think uh, we need to continue to take a step back and walk through this uh, very cautiously. Uh, you know, the idea of having yet another substance that people have access to legally, and I know the arguments of both sides, I think uh, concerns me a little bit. I appreciate that. I'm really glad I asked. Hey, Tom, real quick, uh, just got a couple of minutes here. The last stop for HB 12 I mentioned is uh, Senate Judiciary. This could be very interesting. You know, Joe Cervantes flirted with the idea that legalization in his run for governor, we might recall that. But he's sort of backed off uh, since then. Is this committee where things go to die, this one particularly? You know, it used to be Senate Rules Committee right. uh, is where, where things just went to kind of quietly go away. Um, you know, for Senate Judiciary, they've been pretty good about getting things in and out on a, on a timely basis. I think it will come out of uh, Senate Judiciary for a vote on the full floor. The question is, is what will that finally look like? You know, I think Ed brings up some great points of the, you know, the unintended consequences of legislation like this. Um, it, you know, seeing that there are still four bills out there and really not really an agglomeration of, of what that would look like as far as all, you know, you have all these different perspectives, with, which tells me that perhaps it might be best to wait for an additional year to get all of those different items worked out, maybe in the form of a task force or something along those lines. But uh, Senate Judiciary, they've been pretty good getting things, uh, you know, uh, moving moving the train through. So I think it'll move through uh, and then we'll get into, you know, probably some pretty extensive debate there on the Senate floor. Exactly. That's where the action is going to be. Out of time on this, but it's a good time to remind you of our Growing Forward podcast dedicated to covering cannabis in the industry here in New Mexico. Hosts Andy Lyman of New Mexico Political Report and Megan Kamerick from right here in New Mexico PBS sat down with Emily Kaltenbach. She's of the Drug Policy Alliance to discuss some of the potential sticking points, namely home grows and plant limits, and also how you tax a legal recreational market. Two things in this bill that seem to make lawmakers nervous so far is unlimited plant counts and the ability to home cultivate cannabis. The concern seems to be that maybe home grows and a limited supply will feed the illicit market. Uh, are we talking about dangerous people tied to drug cartels when we talk about the quote illicit market? Uh, we're not talking about dangerous criminals when we're talking about a, f a handful of people across the state who are going to grow a handful of plants. So no, I don't think this is uh, a matter of fueling the illicit market, um, nor um, cutting into the profits of any industry players. Megan, did you have questions? I'm sorry. Well, um, I, I think they're also the log legislators are talking to other states, Colorado specifically, and have some concerns about even if we legalize, we could have a black market. Um, what do you think the bill does that would address some of these concerns, which, which has, I mean, it did happen in Colorado and other places. I mean, there's, there's, I think we all agree that there is a flourishing illicit market right now. And there has been right. Um, until we legalize at a federal level, we're not going to completely eliminate an illicit market. So I think that's, you know, something we all agree on, but there are ways that we can 
try to cripple the illicit market here in New Mexico. And, you know, I believe that House Bill 12 does build in uh, some of that, uh, those, those ways. So, you know, one of it, the reasons is really allowing um, small business to get into the market. So this idea of creating micro businesses where you don't have to have the same amount of capital um, to get in, it, the fees are lower. So what we'll see are smaller businesses moving in, especially in rural areas, giving access, you know, creating these access points for people to purchase in a legal regulatory model, not in the illicit market. It also allows people who have been making their living in the illicit market to move into a legal market. We want that. Right. We don't want to um, not allow someone who's perhaps been previously charged with a drug conviction not to be able to move into the legal above ground market. And so House Bill 12 also makes sure that individuals who may have had a prior drug conviction um, allow them to work in the industry and be licensed, that that wouldn't be the sole reason a license is denied. It was based on their prior uh, record. So those are two really important pieces of the bill that are not only about equity, but it's about uh, addressing the illicit market. The other piece is around your tax rate. When your tax rate is too high, uh, you're going to see uh, the illicit market flourish. And so when we're talking about Colorado, it, there's a stark difference in those tax rates from what's provided in House Bill 12. So House Bill, what we have heard is sort of, and you'll hear the sponsors talk about this, this sweet spot is around 20% um, tax. And if you look at Colorado, their tax can be as high as 30%. So I think that's important um, as we look, in, even in Arizona, um, I believe their tax rate, their excise tax is 16%. If you add on GRT to that, um, I imagine it'd be well over 20%. So we're surrounded by states with higher tax rates. I think that's gonna make a difference in New Mexico. You know, I could see these uh, CCC core members implementing much of the Great American Outdoors Act, working with the Bureau of Land Management on the recreational infrastructure at some place like Rio Grande del Norte National Monument, or repairing a campground at White Sands National Park. Tribal nations have shouldered a disproportionate pandemic burden due to a number of disparities in health and socioeconomic factors, shared housing, lack of indoor plumbing, limited access to health care, elevated underlying health conditions and other contributing factors. Yet Native Americans have been resilient in their fight against COVID-19 and many tribes are now leading the way in the vaccination rollout. NMIF correspondent Antonia Gonzalez scored a great interview this week and speaks with the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, about COVID-19 in Indian country. Dr. Fauci, welcome to New Mexico PBS. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. We know that COVID-19 has hit Indian country hard, but right now tri many tribal nations across the country are outpacing other communities when it comes to administering COVID-19 vaccinations. The Navajo Nation exceeded goals of uh, administering 100,000 doses by the end of, the month of February. What can we learn about how tribal nations are vaccinating their populations? Well, they're doing something right. And I think that what we need to do is set that as an example and keep it up. Uh, what you have is, I guess, the community spirit among the, uh, the tribal nations as such that when you have something that you realize is important for your health, for that of your family, and for that of your community, I know it's a close-knit community. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why when something as life-saving as a vaccine comes along, the uptake of it is very smooth and very efficient. So in that respect, I think the rest of the country might learn a lesson from how things have gone with the tribal nations. And it's no secret that there's a lot of mistrust of the federal government among many people in tribal communities across the United States. 
but tribal leaders, healthcare professionals, other trusted members of tribal communities have really been a part of doing vaccine acceptance. How has this benefited American Indian and Alaska Native people? Oh, very much so. I mean, we have found out not only with COVID-19, but with other interventions in which you want a minority community, a community that has generally been underserved, and a community that has good reason for skepticism. And I say that because anyone who is realistic and looks at the truth, there's no secret that the tribal nations have not historically been treated well by various federal agencies. Hopefully that's gotten better in recent times, but I think the corporate memory of the elders to the younger people is that there's this mistrust. And I think when you get trusted members of the community to examine the data, look at it and say, you know, this is a safe and efficacious vaccine. And it's for that reason that we try to partner with the leaders of the tribal nations and set by example. Some of you may know that I myself and the president and the vice president publicly got vaccinated to show the rest of the world and the country, including tribal nations, that we have confidence in the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. And hopefully that gets translated to the tribal nation community. And right now, tribes have um, the option of either getting vaccine distribution through the Indian Health Service or working with states. Um, tribes across the country, like we said, are doing well. Uh, they're getting both the Pfizer and Moderna, which uh, you need two doses for. Right now, we heard the news about Johnson & Johnson now being approved. Will tribal nations be able to get single-use doses like that vaccine? The answer is yes, Antonia, because I just have been in consultation with our medical team and the plan for the distribution of the J&J &J vaccine will that it will be equitably distributed in exactly the same way that the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines have been distributed. It's based on population per state. And then when you get tribal nations, the same mechanism that got the Moderna and the Pfizer to you will get the J&J &J to you. And let's talk about children for a moment. Uh, right now, Pfizer's available to anyone 16 years and older. When can, we something, when can we see something in the United States being offered to people younger than 16? Well, it's going to be a what's called an age de-escalation approach. There are several companies that have already started studies looking at the 12 to 17, namely high school students. We anticipate that by the time we get to the fall, I'm not sure if it will be the very first day of the opening of the school, but sometime in early fall, we'll be able to get enough information to vaccinate high school students. The studies of getting from 12 to nine, from nine to six, from six to two, and from six months to two years will be in a graded fashion that we likely will not complete that until the end of 2021. So we anticipate that children in the elementary school level will likely have to wait until the first quarter of 2022 before vaccines will be available to them. And Dr. Fauci, you have praised tribal nations for their fight of COVID-19. Tribes have been some of the toughest measures when it comes to emergency response, including mask mandates, uh, lockdowns, curfews, a lot of tough decisions tribal leaders have made over the course of nearly a year now. Um, what can the country learn from that, or is it a little too late? Well, it's never too late, Antonia. I think the country can listen to the fact that what you do need, and that's what we're trying to do, is to have a close cooperation and collaboration between the leaders, in this sense, the federal government and the local states and cities, that when you have that synergy, cooperation and collaboration, things get done very well. When the tribal leaders say this is good for their citizens, for members of the tribal nation, it is the custom and the tradition 
that one listens to the tribal leaders. And that's the reason why it has been so smooth when the tribal leaders have decided that this is good for the health of the individual, the family, and the community, that there has been very good uptake of vaccine by the tribal nation. And as vaccines become widely available, likely by the summer, what is COVID-19 life going to look like after that? I think gradually, it's not going to be like turning a light switch on and off. Gradually, that we will have less and less infection in the community to the point where the risk will be markedly diminished, at which point some of the restrictive public health measures could be relaxed a bit and we could gradually start returning to some form of normality, which I hope will be by the end of the summer and as we get into the fall. Dr. Anthony Fauci, thank you so much for joining us here today on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure being with you. The state Senate this week passed a bill, SB 66, that would cap interest rates for short-term loans at 36%. Now, that might sound high, but the current limit is 175%, believe it or not. About one in five New Mexico households is considered to be living in poverty. And the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty says 65% of high-cost lenders have their storefronts within 15 miles of tribal lands. The state instituted that 175% cap just a few years ago. As we get more data and as more time goes by, other states have blown past New Mexico. And we're now bringing up the rear with one of the highest caps in the country. And Thomas, our lawmakers often look at legislation and point out the worst thing that could happen. Should they be flipping that perspective to weigh the cost of inaction? Well, you know, when it comes to, you know, the payday in general, you know, it's kind of like it's it's that two edged sword, right? You have on one end of the equation, uh, people who desperately need cash and don't have credit to go through traditional banking systems. On the other hand, you have uh, folks who, well, I'll just say 174, 175% interest, uh, which is just, you know, for someone who has access to credit, um, you just, it blows your mind. So, you know, I think proximity is a big issue and that's been addressed in some of the legislation that's been, that's been addressed. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to say that, you know, business and industry should not exist. Um, at least 175% cap not exist. Um, Other states have clearly shown that you can make that industry work with 36% or even lower percentages, uh, that coming from the Santa Fe reporter. Mm -hmm. And also the military, you know, 36% is now their number. It's not, it's not, you know, a a free for all anymore. Uh, I'll go right to Santa, to Julianne on this. You've been doing a lot of coverage now that Tom mentioned the reporter. Um, you're, you're, let me kind of get you to back up just a quick second and your sense of where, Uh, the temperature of the legislature is to make change of this type anyway. This is a big change when you really think about it. Yeah, and so this is a um, reform measure that, as you mentioned, has been, you know, in play. Folks have been advocating for this change for quite some time. It was just in 2017 when New Mexico decided to put a cap on this type of lending at all. And as you mentioned, the cap is a, it's triple digit, which is, I think, ghastly uh, to, to folks who are, you know, getting caught in this kind of spiral. And as Tom mentioned, it, it just seems... Uh, to those who have credit, an incredibly high number. Um, As you mentioned, the federal government has already taken a stance on this when it comes to members of the military. You can't uh, issue one of these loans in any state in the nation uh, to a member of the military at higher than 36%. And I think the backers are saying every New Mexican uh, ought to be treated the same as, as a member of the military when it comes to this sort of gouging type of interest. Um, So you've seen this measure already move out of the Senate. It's now uh, stationed in the House. It's been assigned to the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee, and it's also assigned to House Judiciary. Um, And I think one of the questions that's going to come up and that is already on the minds of the folks that are pushing for this reform is what degree will the um, industry's spending have an impact here as the House debates? Um, We know that this industry has made sizable contributions to politicians, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in the last decade. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an open question here as we move to the House, uh, where the debate is going to center. And then, of course, do we have time uh, before March 20th uh, for this to get to the House floor? Uh, Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, when I hear, listen to Julianne talk about this, it really reminds me how deeply ingrained politically and socially storefront lending is in our state. I mean, this is like a very familiar part of our retail establishments. If you drive up and down main streets all over New Mexico, you know, I, there's a lot of power there in that industry. But is there another way to approach this as opposed to just percentage fixes, 175 versus 36, that kind of thing? Is there something else that can be done here? Well, I think the, the operative word in this, in this whole conversation is predatory mm -hmm. or, or prey. You know, and, and can you say loan shark? And things have things have changed so significantly since the time that uh, we really look at the very high interest uh, rates associated with with this type of lending. Uh, other states um, have, have have mandated a lower uh, a lower interest rate, and some of those companies that are that have shops set up in other states have accepted the lower interest rate, but we haven't. So this idea that other uh, that these these uh, loan uh, businesses would move elsewhere. Well, they've already moved elsewhere and accepted the loan rates and are and are still here. Uh, there are there are a lot of things that, that I think we can do. This is a this is a real a real problem for those who can who can least afford it. Um, you know, one of the ways to approach this too, if if we uh, don't want the legislature to handle this, is uh, the uh, you know we put it on a ballot as a as a ballot initiative and let the uh, let the public citizens decide, you know, how they want to deal with this issue. But this is, a, this is a real problem. And as I mentioned earlier, it preys on those people who can least afford it. So because we are probably last uh, amongst those states who have really aggressively dealt with this issue, I think it's important to take a, take a hard stance and do something this, this session. Mm -hmm. Good point there. Uh, Tom, interestingly, you know, this 36 number, Julianne mentions the military, of course, but we've got California, New York, Texas, Kansas, Florida, these people are all working under a 36% scheme. They haven't had people flee out of there and not make loans anymore. Is this, you know, this idea that it's going to ding all these mom and pop ownerships? But it turns out a lot of them are very large corporations. They're not necessarily mom and pop storefront operations. Can't we just bite the bullet and just go there and see how the marketplace shakes out? <laughs> it, it wouldn't be the first time. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we've seen government intervene in many different ways over the last year. Uh, in, in ways that we never even fathomed. So, you know, I, you know, you could do that as a as a science experiment. I think others other states have already gone there and really tested that already. You know, the the larger issue at play. Uh, I mean, obviously, the predatory lenders or you know the you know the 175 percent cap you know lenders is definitely a concern. But when you look at the the most vulnerable New Mexicans who are really relying on you know that as the la as a last resort, why are they doing that? Okay, chances are because there there's a, an auto shop, uh, maybe a roofer, maybe somebody who's holding something over their head saying, hey, I need my cash now. Mm -hmm. And so you have this cycle of, uh, you know, that just happens to end with the predatory lending. Uh, you know, so, you know, is it is it all the predatory lenders or all the, you know, the loan reform that's needed? Eh, that's that's one aspect of it. But there's a there's a whole other sequence of events that takes place before somebody gets to that point. Mm -hmm. Hey, Julianne, the Catholic Church of New Mexico and other faith groups say this is a social justice issue. Senator Katie Duhigg says allowing a 175 percent interest rate is like giving poison food to a starving person. You guys had that quote in your publication as well. It, it, your sense of how that side of the argument is, is impacting the overall argument. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten a lot of feedback from readers who weren't really aware um, of the situation. And I think that most people, when they hear those numbers, their reaction is, that's not good. That's right. not cool. Um, I think if you look at the other states that have not regulated this industry, we're talking about Oklahoma and Mississippi being the other two states that are not doing a 36% a cap. There are also three states that um, have no regulation about this. You know, I mentioned New Mexico's cap um, is still a cap at 175%. So um, really, this is it's not experimental. Um, this right. this regulation, I think the, the people who are, are pushing for this have made that argument fairly strongly. Um, you know, on the point of the mom and pop, pop storefront, um, the reporter has asked repeatedly for a mom and pop storefront to make themselves known. 
um, and, and talk about their family business uh, being affected by this. And we keep getting uh, franchises of giant corporations who talk about you know, the effects, but um, if there's a mom and pop storefront lender out there that wants to talk about it, um, I'm waiting for them to emerge. I, I, same here at New Mexico PBS, we're with you. Hey Ed, last question real quick, uh, attendant to this effort, uh, this comes up a lot, this came up actually four years ago with this uh, 175 cap uh, legislation, is the idea of financial literacy and somehow tying financial literacy efforts, lessons or, or classes, something to these loans, does that make sense to you in some capacity? Do, we, do, we, it's, do these people have some obligation to teach people how to better manage their own money, or is that something they just don't need to get into? Well, it, it seems to be a, a, a quasi-moral obligation, whether the storefronts and the small uh, high-interest loan places, whether it's their personal obligation, it, it is a social obligation. Uh, it, I, we know that there are credit unions and banks who are already engaged in that type of financial literacy education. Often these people, uh, individuals who find themselves underwater as a result of these payday loans will sometimes go to these banks or credit institution. And as a way to, uh, to get out from, from under this debt, sometimes these banks and credit unions will loan money on the condition that some sort of financial literacy courses, training or education takes place. So this really is a key component uh, going back to uh, you know, some of the points that, that Tom made, is, is that people sink deeper and deeper, there needs to be a way to, to recover. And education is almost always the key to, to any issue. Yep. Some folks are talking about a required course in high school and all kinds of other things. Uh, we'll have to leave that there. Now, Senator Martin Heinrich has once again introduced the 21st Century Conservation Corps Act. It's modeled after the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 1930s, we all recall. It would, people put, it would put people to work on landscape restoration projects, urban and community forestry programs, that sounds good, and a lot more. Correspondent Laura Paskus spoke with the senator from Washington. Senator, President Biden has called for creation of a climate conservation core. And last year, now this year, you've introduced the 21st Century Conservation Corps Act. Here yeah. now in the 2020s, why are we looking back to the original CCC from the 1930s? Because I think the, the fundamental uh, core of the CCC was so incredibly successful. And I know that at a time when I was sort of growing up in natural resources um, policy, I got a chance to get to know many of the people who had served in the CCC. And decades and decades later, they were so enthusiastic about what it meant for their life. And they went in many, many directions from there, but they really credited it with creating their adult selves in many cases and uh, really impacting not just their ability to learn something in the outdoors and be able to contribute, but uh, how much it shaped their character throughout the entirety of the rest of their life. Um, and they would oftentimes wear a CCC belt buckle just as sort of a signal to other CCC members. And I think taking that core and broadening it to the kind of diverse modern uh, you know, population that we have now making it uh, accessible to people from all backgrounds, uh, I think has an enormous amount of attractiveness to it. I love that belt buckle. It's like a bat signal to one <laughs> Exactly. <of them. laughs> so if this bill were passed, how would it benefit New Mexico and New Mexicans, do you think? So in terms of benefiting New Mexico, I think one of the things it would do is really scale up what we all agree needs to happen, which is we need more people, not behind a desk, but out in the field, having an impact on landscapes, making them more resilient, making them more, more climate resilient, doing the, the work that makes these landscapes uh, more functional in the way that they were a few hundred years ago, uh, more um, responsive to fire, less prone to uh, large uh, catastrophic fires, uh, restoring rangeland, working on all of these things that require an enormous amount of labor. And um, at, at a time when 
On the other side of the equation, we have a lot of young people who uh, and a, a labor force that because of the last year of the pandemic uh, would, I think, in many cases, really welcome the opportunity to work in those kinds of environments and to put people back into rural communities that really need uh, these projects to, to maximize the health of their surrounding landscapes. Can you talk a little bit about this intersection between jobs, COVID and climate change? You know, in, in some ways, COVID showed us that, um, that we, I think there's a, we saw a lot of wishful thinking in terms of policy over the course of the last year. Oh, if we just ignore this thing, it'll go away. We don't have to follow the science. And all of that contributed to an enormous public health uh, impact, but also an enormous economic impact in, in many families. And I, I think the connection there is that the science is the science. And yes, we can beat COVID, but it requires an enormous amount of marshalling of resources, cooperation, uh, the utilization of science uh, for the vaccine, for therapeutics, and scale that up many, many, many times over and slow it down a little bit and you have climate change. You know, it is one of those big realities out there that whether we want to believe in it or not is really irrelevant. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to make sure that our kids and grandkids can actually inherit the kind of, uh, the kind of climate, the kind of planet that we all grew up and took for granted? So I love seeing CCC projects around New Mexico. I get excited. Um, the buildings at Bandelier, the building, the lodge at um, Hyde Memorial State Park. I'm curious if you have a sense of, you know, maybe what this 21st century CCC could look like around the state. Well, I think it would leave its footprint in a number of different ways. Some that wouldn't be obvious 100 years from now. Uh, it would just look like a healthier, more productive landscape. Uh, and some that would be physical. You know, when, when, I, uh, when I worked for AmeriCorps as a volunteer in the 1990s, um, you know, we built some of the enclosures that then housed the, the Mexican Wolf Recovery Project and the Breeding Project that, that got that off the ground. Uh, you, you go back to the original CCC, and like you say, you can still see those fingerprints all over the state. So in terms of, you know, I could see these um, CCC core members implementing much of the Great American Outdoors Act, working with the Bureau of Land Management on the recreational infrastructure at some place like Rio Grande del Norte National Monument or repairing a campground at White Sands National Park. And I think decades later, you would still see that physical impact. Those are very enduring things that, that help um, really hold up our economy for decades after they're originally created. So President Biden has spoken quite a bit about climate change executive order early on and his, his administration is pretty comprehensive. I'm curious if we're gonna see the Senate moving on climate change legislation this year. That's certainly my intention. And my hope is that we will rapidly see after we get through the coronavirus uh, response that we're currently working on a pivot to a sort of build back better infrastructure climate legislation that sets the stage for the next few decades, uh, that really gets us to a place of leadership once again in the world and takes advantages, advantage of the opportunities we have to put people to work in this transition uh, to make sure that one, we're taking care of workers who have done things a different way with traditional fuels and at the same time creating the, those economic act opportunities for everything else that we're gonna to have to work on to make this transition possible. When you think about the fact that, you know, we really need to be reducing emissions by 15% a year to be able to meet these targets. Well, thank you, Senator. Good luck in the session this year. We uh, hope that you stay safe. Thank you so much. 
Whatever happened to the push for criminal justice reform? It was the heated cry of a sweltering summer, and New Mexico lawmakers did decide to require law enforcement across the state to wear body cameras, as you recall, but there hasn't been much other action. The Civil Rights Act has some momentum this session, so that's where we'll start. The bill would eliminate the legal doctrine known as qualified immunity as an acceptable defense. And Ed, is this a meaningful step towards reform? And maybe I'd like to get your take short, if you could, on what you think qualified immunity means and what these folks are trying to do in the differences and in, in whether you have support or not support for that. Yeah, the qualified immunity is a doctrine that came about that was created by the Supreme Court and actually was created in the, in the late 60s. In the late 60s, it was created by then what was considered a liberal court or the Warren Court. Up, and it, it went through a decade or so. And then the conservative court, uh, which I believe would be the Berger Court, stepped in and made the, uh, uh, this idea of qualified immunity uh, a, a doctrine that made it very difficult for individuals to sue a, an agency or an individual for civil rights violations. And this is a doctrine, again, that's been decades, decades old. And whenever we talk about reform, I think reform is sort of a big issue that, that communities across the country have been dealing with. Is this a reform issue? I think we want to be move slowly on this idea of moving away from qualified immunity. I understand the, the reasons, the rationale from some of the trial lawyers for moving away from, from that. They, they talk about the justice and the opportunity to ensure that victims have some redress for any wrongs by an individual uh, government worker or an agency, but there are already avenues in which an individual can seek redress. Uh, the concern of this is the motivations behind this reform idea. Is it really necessary? Is it the time? I think we need to go back and look at the Supreme Court's uh, rationale uh, in creating this, this this doctrine in the late 60s during the civil rights that was during the civil rights era and then in the in the early 80s and what was their rationale for it and has that really changed is there the question really remains is there a need for the change at this particular time in the name of reform there's so many other things that we can do in the name of reform uh, and this may not be one of those that, that, that uh, gets to the top of the list. Uh, at least at this point, I think there has to be more discussion. Law enforcement has some concerns about this. Uh, and, uh, and we know that some of the concerns are, are the motivations behind it. The way this bill is created, um, it'll allow for attorney fees to be, to be awarded. And that may be the interest to many, many trial attorneys. And so the concern is it creates another avenue for lawsuits. Right. The entity that ends up holding the bag on this our taxpayers, when you look at uh, the potential costs associated uh, with a measure like this passing at this point. Hey, Julianne, I, Ted Alcorn at the New Mexico In, uh, In Depth had a really interesting piece the other day um, talking about how Colorado, as we all know, carved out um, a qualified immunity defense last year and has just now just seen its first case a woman and her kids in a car that she thought was a stolen car. The woman and the ch children were pulled out of the car by gunpoint. I mean, but it has not opened this floodgate of suits in Colorado. Should we consider that the same experience for New Mexico going forward? Or are they just unique up there and we're just different down here? Or any clues I mean, there? I think it's important to look at this from a more broad perspective than just the phrase qualified immunity, which seems to be the buzzword everyone is latching on to. But what the new, what this proposed um, legislation is addressing are the types of uh, cases that you can bring in federal court for violation of your constitutional rights, your civil rights. Um, you can't bring those kinds of cases in New Mexico courts right now. And so this establishes a way for people to have New Mexico judges and New Mexico juries in the counties where the cases were brought hear these, um, you know, alleged violations where the government has done um, something to, you know, uh, prevent someone from, you know, exercising their civil rights. Um, and that's really the the point of this legislation you know in an in underlying way and so yes it would allow people to bring litigation that they can't bring right now and mm -hmm. we know that litigation remains one of the most effective ways 
to enact change in our present civilization. Um, and I, I think that for that reason, you know, the, the backers want this to, to happen. Uh, Tom, to follow directly on Julianne's point, it's an excellent point. A lot of civil rights attorneys say that without meaningful legislative reform, it is up to the court systems to, you know, set the barometers or the, or the barriers about what folks can do or not do. Um, it, 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 does this ring true for you? I mean, you know, we're talking about officers, we're talking about case agents, we're not just police here. We're talking about folks who do all kinds of different governmental jobs here. So we shouldn't get too hung up on just police officers, certainly. But your, your sense of that, that it, it, we've got to have this or the courts are just going to figure it out. Yeah, well, you just literally took all of my points, one, two, three. <laughs> but, you know, you bring up a great point, you know, and to, to what Julianne was saying as well is that, you know, everybody has the talking points going in on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this, the Civil Rights Act came out of the New Mexico Civil Rights Commission, uh, who this summer was, was or last summer rather, was uh, tasked to take a look at, you know, what is needed. And as a result, the uh, New Mexico Civil Rights Act came about. Mm -hmm. The different talking points we've heard focus on qualified immunity uh, because of the timing of the, of the very disturbing and bad events over the summer. Um, we, you know, a police reform talking point came up. But then, you know, that's as you stated, Gene, it is much larger that it's government reform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to think that right now, if everybody's focused on talking points, it's usually a sign that there's something deeper going on here. And so what you really should be doing, I think, is, is really putting the brakes on this particular piece of legislation just to get everything fleshed out. And when the legislature reconvenes in December uh, to uh, address redistricting, then bring this and put this on the call as well to, to really address so we can get this issue taken care of once and for all. Tom, I got to ask, is that one kick of the can too many, though? We, we did do that once previously. Yeah, um, you could make an argument either way. Um, you know, it, it just seems as if right now that there's uh, there's too much concern out there. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think that people are making the case that perhaps slowing down uh, and uh, and addressing it within this year, I'm not suggesting multiple years or anything like that, or even a special session in July, ah. um, you know, would, would be a good place. But I think right now there's just enough miscommunication and misperception about what this uh, what the issues are, one and two, what the ramifications are, that it's, it's worth just slowing down just a bit. Ed, let me ask you this. Um, we've seen a couple of lawmakers, Moma Estes and, and Stuart Engel particularly, uh, talking about changing licensing processes, which is now the job of a Law Enforcement Academy Board, of course. What's your sense of that? That, that seems like, I, I'm not quite sure where they're getting, where, where they're going with that. But is that the solution here? Is that better for, as you see it? Yeah, based upon my understanding uh, on why uh, Representative Maestas wants to do this is because in its current state, it's moving slow, that, that this process is, is really a slow process and it's not as efficient uh, that I think they'd like to be. Recently, there was a report that there was such a backlog of the, of the right. types of hearings for officer, police officer conduct. And uh, my understanding of this bill is that if we move it into a, a, an area, a department who deals with these types of issues and so many other licensing areas that they create can create a greater efficiency. Mm -hmm. Is that the best place mm -hmm. for it? Well, I, I think it's probably six of one, half a dozen of the others. I think it comes down to, to efficiency sure. as a reason <laughs> for trying to move this. But, but Ed, is, is, are they on to something though about the better training? Is there something there uh, that, that they're talking about? Uh, and, uh, you know, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, tr you know, training is the key. And, and for those who are hearing and making decisions on on these cases, what is the what, what is the most appropriate place for these to for these to be heard? Uh, I haven't seen a, a, a major problem, and and it may be one of those things. If it ain't broke, as they say, don't fix it. Right. But the position is maybe this is broken. And so uh, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Maybe we, we take a look at what's working, where it's currently at, and try to fix some of those issues of, of concern before we move. Uh, either one of the places I think will serve will serve a purpose, but is it necessary? I guess that's the question. Good point there. Uh, Julianne, one last for you. You wrote last summer in the Santa Fe Reporter that Senator Peter Worth expected a, quote, omnibus police reform bill this session uh, he was quoted a few places with that. What happened? Why didn't that happen? 
You know, I really don't have any insight into that. Mm. Um, but I can say that, you know, the topics of police reform have been uh, attempted to be addressed in a variety of ways this session, and, and not a lot of them are seeing traction. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the reporter is still suing the city of Santa Fe over transparency in police discipline records. Um, our mayor doesn't think that the city ought to know whether police are doing their jobs or whether they're being disciplined when they don't do their jobs. Um, there was a, a legislative attempt to address this that I don't think is going anywhere. Um, you know, you mentioned the body cam uh, legislation that passed last session, and we haven't seen anything that's quite that crisp mm -hmm. um, in this session. So I think police reform is something that's going to continue to be debated at our roundhouse uh, long into the future. I agree. All right, we're out of time on that already. Thanks to you all. I'll be back in a moment with a few final thoughts. Earlier this week on the PBS NewsHour, they featured the Education for American Democracy Project, a new plan out from a prominent team of about 300 educators with the goal of revamping history and civics classes in our schools nationwide. It's a wonderful idea, timely and incredibly necessary given what we had let slide over the last generation and what we are witnessing currently, a country untrusting of institutions and addicted to, to corrosive dialogue. If we truly want to have a citizenry that can debate robustly and productively, we need to invest in civic education. Now, what I like best is the idea is that it gives us a chance to reboot when it comes to history, a chance to start anew on who gets to tell history's stories and from what point of view most importantly. As the authors of the project ask, quote, how can we narrate our history in ways that are both clear-eyed and honest about our failings, but without falling into cynicism, and appreciative of our achievements, including the founding, but without tipping into adulation. That sounds like a terrific place to start. Thanks again for joining us. We'll leave you with a look at the snow-covered Sandia Mountains. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.